Hello everyone, we are the Artemis Rhodes team and for the past couple of weeks we've been working towards a project in which we've conducted moon, sample, path, and communication research where we've simulated a rover mission in Shackleton Crater for collection of various samples that will be stored and analyzed. We observed these samples of Shackleton Crater and researched the extraction and applicability of them, concluding with insight into astronaut habitation on the moon in the future. But before we get into that, here's a quick video to introduce the team. Hi, my name is David Backer Peral. I'm from California and I want to major in electrical engineering. Hi, my name is Evelyn Vargas. I'm from Texas and I want to major in aerospace engineering or astrophysics. Hi, my name is Sophia Dasser. I'm from New York City and I want to major in computer science and government. My name is Tyree Gillespie Williams. Uh, I'm from Ohio and I plan on studying ecology. Hi, my name is Manu Doyle. I'm from Washington and I want to major in computer science. Hi, I'm James Liu. I'm from Texas and I want to major in mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Harini Majedi. I'm from Texas and I want to major in computer science. Hi, my name is Summer Nelson. I'm from New York City and I would like to major in environmental science and finance. The Endurance mission will send a sample collection rover to Shackleton Crater to investigate the crater's composition and the presence and applications of volatiles in the crater. Our mission name, Endurance, is a tribute to our destination. Shackleton Crater, located at the lunar south pole, was named for the Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton of the ship Endurance. The Endurance mission patch design was inspired by the Apollo 17 mission patch and the Artemis mission patches. The focus of the patch is the goddess Artemis, whose golden arrow points to a future moon base illuminating the lunar south pole. The patch also features a golden road in recognition of the Artemis Rhodes program. Mars, seen rising just beyond the lunar horizon, highlights our next goal. Bordering the patch are the names of our 18 members. The Shackleton Crater is 20 kilometers in diameter and around 4 kilometers deep at the lunar south pole, thrice as deep as the Grand Canyon. Due to the lunar axial tilt, the interior of Shackleton Crater is perpetually in shadow, while portions of the rim are permanently sunlit. The crater is a location of interest for future manned lunar missions due to the cold trap created by the permanent shadow, which could potentially preserve volatiles such as ice doors, rare earth elements, and volcanic glass materials all in one area, an uncommon overlap. The sunlit portions of the rim could also provide solar energy to power habitation, infrastructure, and instruments in future missions. In 2010, orbital neutron measurements from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, observed that if lunar hydrogen was in the form of H2O, it would indicate a concentration of 1.5% by weight in the lunar polar regions, including Shackleton Crater. 2018's Chandrayaan-1 mission conclusively confirmed the presence of water ice in regions of the lunar poles, and recorded absorption lines indicative of hydroxyl compounds and possibly of water ice within Shackleton Crater. The analysis of many RF measurements made by the LRO found that the circular polarization ratio, or CPR, of the Shackleton crater walls decreased with depth. If ice were the cause for higher CPR readings near the top of the crater walls, we would expect a discontinuity in the CPR gradient at boundaries between seasonally sunlit and permanently shadowed regions of the crater, which was not present. Overall, CPR analysis established an upper limit of 5-10% water ice composition in the topmost meter of lunar regolith within Shackleton crater. The albedo of the far side of the moon is 0.22, and the measured albedo of the crater floor was within 0.05 of 0.23. As the albedo of water ice is 1.0, the similarity between the measured albedos rules out the possibility of any single area of exposed surface ice greater than 10 square meters. The Endurance rover mission must therefore confirm the presence of subsurface ice, the most likely form of ice deposit present, particularly within the topmost meter of the lunar regolith on the crater floor. Thus, our rover will be equipped with a drilling tool to extract core samples. As for reaching the moon, the figure eight trajectory that we follow may initially appear counterintuitive, but is far easier than traveling in a straight line. The Earth, when we view it from a position above the North Pole, rotates from west to east, much like the moon does, while traveling around the Earth in the same direction. Both the Earth and the moon's eastern edges, which are known as leading edges, face the direction of their momentum. Thus, when a spacecraft performs a gravity assist or flyby, it is influenced by the gravitational pull of nearby bodies. If the spacecraft passes the moon's trailing edge, 
it receives a significant boost in momentum due to its alignment with the direction of travel. If it flies past close enough with a fast enough speed that it won't be captured and starts orbiting the body, the spacecraft will then be slingshot around and will speed up. If the spacecraft flies past the trailing edge, it gets more momentum as it follows the direction of travel, where on the other hand, passing the leading edge provides a smaller boost. To best execute missions, every spacecraft is launched towards the east, so take advantage of the Earth's rotation and require less fuel to reach orbit. This technique was utilized in previous missions, which changed the orbit from a nearly circular one to an elliptical one, which allows for a faster mission. Passing through the trailing edge would result in the crew being stuck in space much longer, more fuel, and consumables, which aren't in abundance to provide. By changing the spacecraft's path to an ellipse by passing the leading edge, it brings the spacecraft back to Earth without any crew input and allows for a gravitational break. The end result is what Apollo 8's trajectory looked like, a figure eight. And the Artemis 1 mission follows the same basic shape, entering the moon's orbit from the leading edge to perform a figure eight pathway. To minimize the weight of the fuel needed for the endurance mission, gravity assist is a major component of the flight path. There is also a natural equilibrium or stability between the orbits of the Earth and the Moon, illustrated by the gravity contours and the ground points of the Earth-Moon system. By utilizing this equilibrium in our flight path, we can further reduce the fuel needed for our mission. Once our rover has reached the Moon, it will enter into a near rectilinear or halo orbit around the Moon with respect to Lagrange point 2, giving us optimal access to the South Pole. Once over Shackleton Crater, entry, descent, and landing, or EDL, will commence. Part of Endurance was to design a model rover to explore the Shackleton Crater and to obtain samples in order for further analysis of habitation on the moon. In order to best simulate the mission, we designed our entire robot under two principles. To simulate accurate crater conditions and to minimize the contamination of both the sample and the surface of the moon. While designing the robot, we employed a four-step design process, including brainstorming, research, CAD, and iteration on each mechanism, to efficiently build and test components for continuous improvement. For the chassis, we did, the biggest challenge was to be able to easily maneuver the surface without risking tilting and falling over. As a result, we decided to implement a suspension system on our base. In our initial design, we implemented a pendular suspension system that only provided one axis of rotation horizontally. This proved to only work 17% during testing due to not providing vertical movement and getting stuck while moving up a structure. Rev2 provided a swing axle suspension system, which allowed for more vertical mobility and increased the success rate to over 90%. Our first claw design used a direct one-on-one gear train. This design proved difficult to both attach a motor and effectively secure the core sample. To solve the motor attachment problem, we added a bevel gear to the claw. However, this attachment made the claw asymmetrical and therefore difficult to attach to any type of lift. Our third rev of the claw added two beams in order to better secure the sample. However, the sample could not maintain a consistent position every time. Rev 4 used warm gears and had an aligner for the sample to be pushed onto every time. This allowed for not only a larger grab radius, but also consistent grabbing positions. To reduce contamination of the sample, it is important to lift the sample. Our initial design was a parallel linkage system. This design did not allow the claw to be parallel to the ground, which made the claw change the grab angle virtually every time. To make the lift more consistent, we tried a linear slide. The slide, however, took up too much vertical room and the lowest the claw could go was actually 6.35 centimeters. Rev3 was similar to an elevator mechanism, however, instead of pulleys, we used warm gears. This allowed for 100% consistency in vertical movement, however, similar to Rev2, it took up too much vertical room. Our final design was an improved linkage system that provided three axes of rotation. This allowed the claw to move parallel to the ground and maintain the same orientation throughout the entire lift process. Although we tried to make our model as realistic as possible, building out of Legos and time constraint limited us from adding multiple features that we would add on a real rover. For one, we wouldn't be able to use regular tires due to several differences in the moon's composition, such as its atmosphere, surface, and gravity, which would cause regular wheels to break, reduce traction, and several other consequences. As such, we would want to use metal wheels similar to those of NASA's by permission, as seen in the video to the right. We would like to acknowledge Ms. Emily Soden from NASA's team on the Viper mission for her support and invaluable contributions to our project. In the video to the right, you'll be able to see our model rover collecting the model samples on the moon. Another important factor to consider in a more realistic design for the rover is the power source. Solar-powered batteries such as those seen on Viper would not be feasible due to shackles and crater's size. The rover wouldn't be able to explore in depth if it had to periodically return to the surface to recharge. As such, we would opt for a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, such as the one found on Perseverance, to be able to power the rover for an extended period without access to sunlight. 
The Artemis Rotis rover would be controlled to serve a mix of autonomous and human control. Unlike the Mars missions, which send overnight instructions for the rovers to complete during the day due to signals taking multiple minutes, moon rovers can receive signals within seconds. This would allow the rover to receive human commands more frequently and would even allow them to remote control it. As such, the rover software would include both an artificial intelligence system allowing the rover to complete tasks on its own, as well as the option for specific commands or remote control. The rover would also have a mechanical drill to drill into the ground and extract the sample. To store the sample, it would drill out a cylindrical chunk and pack it into a tight container to avoid any movement of the sample in order to keep the sample intact. To determine where to drill, the rover would use existing satellite data on the levels of hydrogen, thermal mapping, radar pulses, and near-infrared light reflection in order to determine the most likely locations for where water is found. Although the end goal would be to return the samples extracted, extracted from shackles and crater to the Earth using a full lab, the mission would still have a small lab within the rover to be able to analyze the composition of the samples. In order to find a path that was suitable for endurance, one must be familiar with the geography of Shackleton Crater. After studying topographical and geomorphic maps, it was found that the rim of Shackleton is littered with deep banks and slopes known as scarps that could drop as low as 10 meters. In order to mitigate damage to the rover as well as any samples it carried, the rover will land in a spot free of as many scarps as possible. Communication between the Earth and the Moon is an important thing to consider as we venture further into the realm of cis-lunar travel. Because of the relatively close proximity of the moon, all communications to and from our rover will have a delay of about 6 to 10 seconds, as opposed to the 20 minute delay in communications with Mars. During the Apollo era, line of sight communication was the prevailing communication method, but continuous communication between the Earth and our landing site at the lunar south pole, as it stands, is impossible, and poses a major problem for future lunar missions with the possibility of hours long communication blackouts. Communication is vital to space exploration. For Earth-based support in both manned and unmanned missions, where unexpected or unanticipated obstacles inevitably arise. The lunar south pole, the target of the proposed endurance mission, is rugged. Line of sight communication will be affected by high obstructions such as crater walls, rocks, etc. Additionally, as the moon rotates, it will itself become an obstruction to communication. Thus, our rover will relay its communications to the Earth through the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, when line of sight communication is impossible and the LRO is overhead. This solution is only short-term and suitable for the purposes of this mission, though future lunar missions of larger scopes must consider the development of reliable lunar communications infrastructure, much like that of the Earth. The South Pole, and specifically the Shackleton Crater, contains an overlap between creep, volcanic glass, and ice materials. Hence, it is the best place to collect samples from. The few known pristine creep rocks are basaltic lavas. Basalt results from the rapid cooling of molten rock from extensive lava flows. As visible in the figure, creep basalt contains high contents of various rare earth metals in comparison to other low TI aluminous mare basalts, displaying the relevance of analyzing the samples for future rare earth metal extraction on the moon. To allow for long-term human presence in space, the extraction of extraterrestrial raw materials known as in situ resource utilization is required to eliminate the need for shipping such resources or manufactured materials from Earth. The five most beneficial areas of ISRU for future robotic and human exploration are resource characterization and mapping, mission consumable production, civil engineering and surface construction, energy generation, storage, and transfer within in-situ resources, as well as manufacturing and repair using in-situ resources. In addition to hydrogen and oxygen utilization, the extraction of rare earth metals from lunar samples is currently being explored. Creep samples, which is an acronym, K for potassium, rare earth elements, REE, and P for phosphorus are of important interest. The content of uranium, thorium, neodymium, and other elements within these samples is highly valuable due to the increased demand and limited opportunities for rare metal reusage. Rare earth metals are one of the main components of the communications and nuclear energy industries, as well as the construction of electric vehicles. In terms of nuclear power of lunar vehicles, uranium and thorium could hypothetically be extracted and used to power said vehicles. The second sample is the lunar troctolite. The lunar troctolite is a rock type within a group of ultramafic platonic rocks from the moon known as the MG Su. This rock type contains volcanic glass and lunar apatite beads, which can show evidence of pre-existing bodies of water on the moon through analysis and connection to the lunar magma ocean. Understanding the moon's magma ocean in depth could help us understand the development of Earth's. 
new techniques such as secondary ion mass spectrometry were employed to examine hydroxyl, fluoride, and chloride in appetite samples from three distinct lunar sources. As seen in the figure, the method of measure validates the existence of significant amounts of water in the form of hydroxyl. What can the glass beads tell us? In figure one, it can be seen that there are significant correlations between the volatile contents measured for the very low titanium glasses. In figure two, the sharp decrease in volatile content from core to rim suggests that the volatile contents are indigenous to the moon and were affected by degassing during magma eruption. Computational simulations that consider the degassing suggest that there is an estimated water content of 745 parts per million at a 95% confidence level. From the analysis of these volcanic glasses, the possibilities are endless. Remarkably, we can learn about the origin of Earth's plate tectonics and water by comparing Earth's delayed plagioclase crystallization, which is related to magma ocean composition, to that of the Moon. The Moon is ideal for this analysis because of its preserved rock record due to the lack of erosion, atmosphere, and plate tectonics. Our team would like to thank Dr. Tab Prizel of the JSC for all of his guidance during our research journey. Our third and final sample is the ice core sample. When we obtain our ice core sample, our drill and container must be composed of steel, Teflon, and aluminum in order to avoid sample contamination. One of the most astounding discoveries from Clementine and Prospect, two rover missions that explored the lunar south pole, is that within the south pole Aitken Basin, there are permanently shadowed areas that possess sufficient environments to accumulate frozen volatiles in the coal trap. Deposits of ice on the moon have many practical aspects for future manned lunar exploration. There is no other source of water on the moon, and shipping water to the moon for use by humans would be extremely expensive, possibly $2,000 to $20,000 per kilogram. The lunar water could serve as a source of oxygen and hydrogen, which can be extracted and used for rocket fuel or breathable air. Paul Spudis, one of the scientists who took part in the Clementine study, referred to the lunar ice deposits as possibly the most valuable piece of real estate in the solar system. When it comes to a mission as paramount to human discovery as this, it is imperative that the astronauts with boots on the ground get everything they need to survive and thrive on the moon. Ideally, an astronaut's needs in terms of food, water, housing, health, and communication with mission control will be accommodated for on the moon. Prepackaged foods, hydroponic systems, and systems for recycling waste into clean water, similar to that on the ISS, are a good place to start when thinking about food and clean water. Much similar to how Artemis III has been planned, our astronauts will be housed in or near the landing system they came from, and from there, communicate with mission control and complete tasks. Isolation from Earth is definitely stressful, so regular communication with loved ones and mental health professionals is a must. Measures also need to be taken in order to minimize medical emergencies through regular deliveries of medicine and mandatory first aid training for all astronauts. Thanks to SEAS, I found a supportive and ambitious STEM community. Because of SEAS, I want to pursue undergraduate research opportunities in STEM. SEAS has really taught me in the importance of the design process in everyday life. My experience at SEAS has further inspired me to pursue my goal of becoming an astronaut. SEAS boosted my confidence in communicating and working with others on projects. SEAS has made me realize how interdisciplinary space science is and has given me lifelong connections with people all over the country. SEAS has allowed me to explore the abundance of career opportunities within engineering. SEAS has encouraged me to continue pursuing computer science and continuing research in aerospace engineering. We would like to extend a thank you to NASA and the Center for Space Research for hosting the NASA SEAS program. We would also like to thank Dr. Emily Certain, Dr. Alexandra Mateli, Dr. Tab Prizel, Dr. Susanna Foxworth, and our dear mentor, Ms. Angelita Crenshaw, for their guidance and expertise. Special thank you to Mrs. Selena Miller and Mrs. Margaret Baggio for organizing the NASA SEAS program.